Hello, welcome to Zigma Tech Learning Hub. I will be your instructor for fine art. You can call it visual art as well, cultural and creative art. Now for this class, we are going to be taking our exercises from the exam guide app. Now, if you don't have this application installed already in your device, I will advise you download this app in order for you to follow along this class. Now, Exam Guide is a leading educational app that helps students prepare adequately for exams, for various exams, such as UTME, post-UTME, WASE, GCE, KCPE, IJMB, JUPEP, Calbepedia, BESE, JSCE, NCEE, NECO, to mention but a few. You can download the app from our website, www.examguide.com or you can download it as well as using your Google Play Store. Please subscribe to our channel and turn on the notification bell to update, to be updated on new videos as we upload. Now, if you're ready for today's class, okay, let's get started. Okay, welcome back to Cultural and Creative Arts for, you know, for today. And um, this is the part three of um, what we've been doing so far. You know, we've been talking about art tools and materials, you know, for the past two sections. So this is the final and the last part, which is the part three. So without any further ado, let's just hit the road running because we have a lot to cover up today. All right. So today we'll be looking, our first tools or material that we'll be looking at today is known as the huge brush, or you can call it the hook brush or the hook brushes. Now, these are hairy, strong, you know, strong brush. Now, we have two types of brush. We have the huge brush and then the sable brush. The one word we're going to, I might not be able to explain that of the sable brush, but let's look at the huge brush. That now you can actually differentiate between the huge brush and the sable brush. Now, the, sable, the huge brush, they have their hair brush, you know, that, they, that, are, that are different in sizes and uh, in shape. They have different um, different pointers and um, they are usually used on canvas. They are strong, but not too very strong. And uh, that is what they're actually used for. Now, they, they have the, the texture of a, of a feather, of a feather, now of a, could be of a bed or cheek, any of those stuff, but that's how it looks like. Don't worry, I will show you exactly how the huge brush looks like. Now let's look at how we can take care of this brush. Now you keep them firmly intact and then always wash them immediately you're done because if you leave them, they dry with the paint, they get stick and it gets damaged immediately. You can no longer make use of them. And again, whenever you're using them, you don't apply too much pressure on them because of the, in as much as yes, the hairs on it are quite soft and they are quite stable, not a stable brush. But you don't use apply too much pressure on them. If not, you would damage them. You just you just damage them speedily. But they, they can actually uh, withstand pressure compared to the sable brush. The sable brush they are more fragile. You know that's where we have the points one and uh, to mention but a few there. However, but uh, when you're using the, the huge brush, you use them not with too much pressure and all that. I will show you what the huge brush looks like. All right. So how you can actually improvise the huge brush? Now you can improvise the huge brush. You can use your coconuts, you know, when you, the back of a coconut, you can mash them and then use that stuff as huge brush. You can use your feather to improve, to, to improve. even the raffia can also be used, you know, to improvise the huge brush. All right. So now let's go over and look at how the huge brush look like. Now you see exactly the different types of huge brush we have. We have the round huge brush, which is this one. We call them the points, the points huge brush. You can call them the round huge brush. It comes in different sizes from point 0.1, point 0.2, down to point whatever, depending on the product you're working with. Now, we have the flat huge brush. Now, this one too, where you use them to make what? Elaborated strokes. Each of these brushes comes in different sizes. They come in different sizes. So, we use this one for normal, the normal painting. They will have the bright huge brush. It looks so much like the flat brush, but they are not the same. They are, their functions are different. If you watch their mouths, the shape of their mouths actually differs. However, bear this in mind that each of those brush comes in different what in different sizes and different points now the next one we have is what is the field brand brush is what the field brand brush now that is another brush that looks like the flat brush or the bright brush and then we have the fan brush now the fan brush we use the fan brush to um, to to make a flower kind of designs and all that then we have the angular brush that is if you want to get 
a kind of um, stroke in your drawing. Same thing applies to the what to the move brush, and then we'll have what the riga brush. The riga brush is to write. You know, if after drawing, you can use it what to sign on your painting. So these are the different types of brush. Now, all these fall under the huge brush because they have a kind of seemingly strong symbol uh, um, strokes on it. Will I call them? Uh, Whatever, I don't know, I don't just know the name to call them, but it has this uh, f um, soft uh, feather kind of uh, texture. Yes, that's why they are all called what a huge brush. All right, now let's look at the next material. Now, this beautiful. Now, this is another perfect example of what the huge brush. If you look here, you see the point. You see, you see the point. So, it is another different perfect example of what how the huge brush look like. All right. So now the next thing we'll talk about is the king. Is the king now what is the king now the king is an enclosed or is a compartment for firing what molded potter maybe after throwing a ceramic ware you know after building the ware after making your flower vases and your cup jug mug verse etc you have to keep them to you know to get hardened and then before you send them into the king for the final firing now we have two ways we fire we fire the first firing the first stage of firing which is known as the biscuit firing. Now, that's why I don't worry. By the time we start talking about ceramics or clay, I will break this down in, um, you know, in bits. But however, kin is the machine that is used to fire clay ware. Now, we have different types of kin. We have the local kin and the industrial kin. Now, the local kin, uh, uh, the local kin and the electric kin. Now, the local kin, they are built, you know, like brick, with bricks, like a mud house. So, they build them and then create where they heat their wood and then put the fire, and then the heat from the fire will actually be transferred straight to the cane and hit the cane. So now the cane is used to fire what? Clay wear. Now it usually comes, it has what, it most, um, the electric cane comes with what? A temperature thermometer, you know, to read the temperature that is inside the cane, that is inside the cane. So the temperature determines when the wear inside the cane are what? Matured during what? firing so whenever you're firing you use that thermometer to check like a kind of cone to check that is if you're using the electric cane but if you're using the mobile cane um, the local cane you have to use your subconscious you understand just like your mom if she's cooking she does not use the thermometer to know when the food is done so as a professional let me say as a ceramics if you're firing you should know when the ceramics they're okay as in you learn this over time it's not what you just start doing and then you get it perfectly no even your mom or your parents when they start cooking they don't just learn how to cook immediately it takes them time to know. You see, at their first time of cooking, they will cook, they will cook rubbish. So you too, it applies the same way to everybody in every skill that you're working on. So the same thing with the king. So whenever you're working with the king, you know there is a certain amount. And meanwhile, you should understand the kind of clay you're working with. Because every clay has their own firing um, capacity. There are some clay, if you fire them in a very high temperature, they burst. So I don't want to start talking about clay today. So we are just talking about art material, but I'm trying to explain it in details so you understand exactly what it means. So canes, they are used to fire what? Clay. So how then do you take care of cane? Just like your normal um, stove or your gas cooker. After using the cane, you make sure you keep it clean. Uh, you, don't, um, you don't allow it. You don't keep it dirty. You remove the clay wear in them and then, you know, make sure the cane is wear kept, you know. To avoid the damage now cane can be built now how do you improvise cane now there are several ways you can actually improvise cane now it can be built or constructed locally by using what burnt bricks you know your these bricks for you some of you you are very young you might not understand how the bricks look like but they look like block but this time around they are small small blocks so they, they mold them with your red uh, with your red mud or clay so after molding, then they heat them. So we use them what to make what's cane. You can actually build it as a as a mud house. That's exactly how it looks like. Uh, I will show you exactly how the cane look like. And however, we have the electric cane that cannot actually be improvised. Um, um, improvised. You just have to. Okay, you can actually improvise it. You can use your oven in place of what the electric cane. But you know, it will be more expensive. It will take you more gas and all that. So that is a, another material for ceramics. Okay. So now, if you're beautiful, now look at the diagram we have there. It is the perfect example of what a king look like. Now, the one by my right is the electric king. It is the electric king. You see inside, by this side, you see the thermometer, where you can actually gauge 
exactly what is happening inside. So you load your clayway right inside the cane and then you shut the door. You on and then it fires. Some clay can fire for three hours, four hours, depending on the kind of clay you're working with. Now look at this is the local cane. You see how it's built like a mox. You see, so that's exactly how the local cane looks like. So you load your clay, your, your wear inside at the back. Then you put your fire and then shut it down. Then the heat from the fire will bake the clay. So this is exactly how the cane look like. For those of you that have not seen it, um, there was a time I was traveling to uh, uh, a place in Nigeria. I guess that's a... Ah, I forgot the name of that place, but they have a lot of ceramics company there around that state. So I saw some of their claims. Their claims. So you can actually, you know, take your time, pay a visit to Lokoja. So you can actually go down to Lokoja and uh, Elori. Yes, you can go there, then you see some of these uh, local claims. Now, the next thing we'll talk about is the next art material we'll discuss is the loom. Is the loom. The loom, most times it comes in vertical or in horizontal words form it has different shapes and sizes i'm going to show you some pictures of the loom so that you know understand but first what is a loom a loom is an equipment that is constructed for weaving now they use the, the, the loom to weave it contains a frame of which strips of what thread is fixed vertically you know to form the warp and then it is now and um, it, it has a space where they allow a shuttle. There is, there, is, there, is, there is a tool called the shuttle. You pass your shuttle and then on that shuttle, you have what we call what? The weft, the weft. So the weft will pass vertically through the horizontal uh, warp, you know, to form your material. I'm going to show you exam exactly how the loam looks like and what is used. We have two types of loam. We have the industrial loam and then we have the locally what made loam. Now the industrial mechanical looms, um, driven um, looms these are machines they are large machines that are used to you know to make these clothes faster to make them faster compared to the manual or local loom now how do you take care of the loom first you prevent children from playing with it because it's kind of attractive if a little child or you know little children come close to it they want to climb on top of it they want to you know play with it so you take it keep little children away from it to avoid them damaging it keep all the accessories like the shuttle the fork the batting etc in a safe place when not in use so the shuttle like i said that is where you have your weft tied on you keep it safe because it looks like a, it looks like the mouse or will i say it looks like it carries uh -huh. so after using them you keep them safe with the fork and uh, the batting you keep them safe even though children can pick these things and then damage it then you have to buy another one or you start recreating them and then how can you construct or how can you improvise the loom you can actually improvise the loom by getting a carpenter or a fabricator you know to make one for you that is an experienced fabricator not everybody can do it so you need somebody that has actually that knows how to produce it that can actually produce it for you mainly most carpenters if, if you give them the pictures they can actually create the loom for you all right so now let's take a good look at them um, the pictures of yes the looms now if you see the loom that we have here now this is an industrial loom it is not a manual kind of loom these looms they are machined they are, they are mechanical you know they are controlled by you know either by electric or by the gen so this is the warp and then the weft is passed somewhere inside there the same thing that applies to this too you understand so i guess this is what holds the the weft that goes through the warp. All right. So now let's see the local loom. Now this is the perfect example of what the local loom. This is how it looks like. So you can actually tell the carpenter to create this for you. That is for high profile carpenters. They can actually make it for you. So this is the loom. It is a tool for weaving. The loom is what a tool for weaving of what fabrics. All right. So now let's take a look at another art material that we are going to consider today is the palettes. The palettes. Now what's the palette? The palettes are used to mix colors. They are like plates. We use them to what? Mix different what colors for painting. It is flat, you know, it's mostly used by the painters. It has, some of them has cups where you can actually pour your, you know, your color. Most times to the graphics and even the textile designers, they use the palette. So the palette can actually be improvised with 
by anything. You can use plate as a palette. You can use glasses as a palette. You can use even cup as a palette. You can use containers as a palette. So how can you take care of a palette? Always wash them clean. Take it out of place of children. Don't keep it closed where, you know, somebody can step on it, you know, because you have colors on it. If you keep it anyhow, somebody can actually step on it and then use the color and then paint your entire room. So after working, you keep the palette safe. You keep the palette, but safe. So a friend of mine or my lecturer will say how and that a painter is as neat as his palette. Yes, that a painter is as neat as what as his palette. Automatically, if your palette is dirty, automatically you are a dirty painter. So men looking at your palette, I can tell what kind of a painter you are. So now let's take a good look at how the palette looks like. Beautiful. Now, if you look, you see this palette. You see how the painter mixes his colors on the palette. And then from there, he can actually do, do what? Do his paintings. So that is exactly how a palette looks like. All right. So now let's look at the next one. The next thing we'll talk about is the palette knife. Is the palette knife. You say, Mr. Christopher, we just talked about palette. So does palette have a knife? Oh, yes. We have a palette knife. Now, the palette knife is a wooden tool. It's a wooden handled what, tool that is made out of flexible metal. It is used for proper what, mixing of what, oil color. Now, we use the palette knife to mix oil color. And we also use it what, as a brush to paint. Now, most times, there's what we call the oil color. Now, the oil color, when you press it out of the tube, you need a palette knife to match it. And then you add your linseed oil to mix the paint. Now, that is exactly what the palette knife works. It looks like a, um, like a, a trawler. Eh? You know, these people that uh, build house, that plasters house. Yes, that's exactly how the palette looks like. So, now, how do you take care of the, the palette? Now, after painting, or after mixing your color, you wash to prevent what? Rust. You wash it what? To prevent rust. And you keep it in a dry, safe place. And don't just keep it anyhow, because somebody can actually step on it, and it will cut, just like the name implies, palette knife. So, you take care of it what? Like a knife. A palette knife does two things. It is used for painting and to mix what? Colors. Now, there is a painting known as the impasto. It's a style in painting. Now, this impasto style is a style where you use lumps of color, large lumps of color to what? To paint. So, whenever you're painting, if you want to create an impasto, you can't create an impasto with your brush. So, you need a palette knife to create what? An impasto. The impasto is a style of what? Of painting. All right. So, how do you get a palette knife? A palette knife can be gotten... Or how can you improvise a palette knife when there is no palette knife? You can actually use a flat, you know, you can use a wood, you can use a flat zinc or any flexible metal, you know, to, to mix your color. That is when you don't have a palette knife. So now let's take a look at how the palette knife looks like. Now, I know most of you have seen this before. And the palette knife, yes, get this in mind. Now, the palette knife comes in different sizes, shapes, and forms. It comes in different sizes, in different shapes, and in different what? In different forms. So these are the shapes and the sizes of what? Of a palette knife. There are some that are bigger and longer than this. So some of them are very big and longer than this. So this is what how the palette knife looks like. My favorite palette knife is palette knife number one and number three. Those are my two favorite palette knife. And I also make use of four and five anyway. So that is just that. All right. Now let's go over and look at the next art material we'll talk about is the pastel. The pastel. Now the pastel is a kind of, is a color. It's a pigment of color. You no, know, It comes in chalk. We we'll have two types of pastel. We we'll have the chalk pastel and then we we'll have the oil pastel. Now what does the oil pastel do? We use the pastel to paint. It's a painting medium. It is chalky. Most of them is kind of chalky and then it's, it's you know, and then it's a baked kind of oil color. And like I told you initially that the pastel comes in what? Two sides, two times. We have the chalk pastel and then the oil pastel that is simply used for what? Drawing in class, you know, and by the students or by artists. So that is what the pastel is used for. So no, now how do you take care of the pastel? Just like your normal regular paint, you don't keep it anyhow. Somebody might trample on it, kick it and scatter it. Just like your chalk, as your chalk breaks or if somebody steps on it, it pieces. So that's exactly what happens towards the palette. So whenever you're, when you're done or when you're not using the palette, you make sure you take it out and then keep it in a safe place so that children or any other person cannot what, play with them. So now, how then do you improvise color and um, improvise pastel? Now, you can use any other color like your crayon whenever you don't have your pastel. Or you can use your poster color to improvise whenever you don't have what, the pastel. Pastels currently now, they are quite expensive. You know, they are, but they look very beautiful and interesting. 
to use them to paint. So that is that about the pastel. So let's take a good look at how the pastel look like. Now, beautiful. Now, this is the chalk pastel on my right, and this is the oil pastel on my left. So if you're looking at it, you might think, what? It was, it was like, Christopher, but this looks like a crayon. Yes, it looks like, but it is not crayon. These are what? Pastel. Pastels are different from what? From crayon. The difference between, the major difference between pastel is that it's, it's, it's more stronger. Like when I mean stronger, the colors are more stronger and brighter than that of what? The crayon. <coughs> Jesus. All right. You call that off now, right? All right. All right. So now that is that about the pastel. All right. The pastel. Okay. All right. So now. Mm. No, let me just state it because I'm done with this. So that's ATM. And let me take the next one. You can just cut it off and take the next one. Yes. So. All right. So now the next art material we'll look at is the raffia. Is the raffia. So now what's the raffia? Now these are dry. Uh, it could be thread. It could be palm front. It could be, you know, any of these uh, cane that is converted into what? Ropes. They use them in making different things. They can use them to make fabric. You can use them to make, um, you can use them to make mats. You can use them to make ropes. You know, this, you see the cow. There's this kind of rope they used to tie cow before now, before we start getting plastic. So that is exactly what the raffia is and how it looks like. Now, how can you uh, keep, protect the raffia? You protect the raffia from water. Too much hamantan damages it. You know, like if you expose it to, when it gets too dry, it becomes hardened. Yeah? It becomes hardened and it starts breaking. So you keep it in a comfortable, you no, know, where normal temperature and then take it out of the risk of children. Now, how do you make raffia? Now, you can twine any synthetic or thread to form raffia. So that's exactly how simple the raffia is. So let me just show you exactly what the raffia looks like so you have a full knowledge of what the raffia is. I know most of you can relate with this. Now, this one is matte. And this is, um, I don't know what they're trying to create here. So that's exactly how the raffia looks like. We use that rope to tie things, you know? So that's just what the raffia is. Now let's look at the mallets. Let's look at what the mallet. Now we have two major types of mallets. We have the wooden mallet and the rubber mallet. It looks like a hammer. You can call it what? A wooden or a rubber what? Hammer that is used alongside what the chisel and the gorge for carving activities. That is exactly what the mallet is and is used for. Remember I told you that the mallet is in two types. We have the, wood, the wooden mallet and the rubber mallet. Now, it is used for what? For carving alongside with what? Chisel, you know, chisel. That is exactly what the, raff and the, the mallet is. Okay, it is also used to heat and shape into what? Place materials not as hard as what? Metals. So for ceramics, most times the ceramics guys use it. Even for those of you that have seen these people that does them interlock, you know, when they are doing this interlock, they use the, 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 the mallet to heat those interlocks together. I hope you understand, you know what they call an interlock. If you don't know, just ask your mom or ask anybody around you, sir, and see what's interlock. They will explain that to you. So most times it has a rubber head. Most of them has a rubber head. Why some has what? A wooden head. And now, how do you take care of the mallet? You don't use the mallet on metals. You will damage the head. You don't use it on a stronger object than what you're using it for. If it is a wood, you can actually use a mallet on a wood, but if you use a mallet on a nail, it will damage the head of the mallet. So how do you make a mallet? So you can make a mallet with any strong six-side pieces of wood can be used as what? A mallet, you know? And then you just look for a wood and carve it into for the handle to fix it inside. Let me show you exactly how the mallet is. So this is the perfect example of a mallet. Now these two are the wooden mallet. This very one, this very one, let me see if I can actually zoom it. Now, this very one is um, a wooden mallet. Why this is the metal, is the rubber mallet? They are, all, they are popular, they are very familiar tools that you can actually relate with. So these tools are, is exactly what we call the mallet. So let's go over to our next uh, material, which is known as what well, the spatula. The spatula is a piece of carved wood for 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 modeling, both in sculpture and in ceramics. Now, for those of you that have um, that know cake designers, they also have spatulas. Even in your kitchen, you have spatulas. Spatulas are things you use to turn things, you use them to mix things. 
So you see, they come in different shapes and in different forms and in different sizes. Now they come, some of them come in plastic, some of them come in metal form, some of them come in wooden form. So that is exactly what spatula used. So how do you take care of spatula? Wash and keep them in a what? In a well-dried place, even in a box after use. So how can you make a spatula? You can make a spatula by getting any wood and carving it into the desired shape that you want to do that job that you want. So that is exactly how the patula. Okay, let me show you exactly how the patula looks. Now, this is the perfect example of what? Of a patula. You see? You see how they look? Hope you can relate. Now, they use them to carve, you know, to remove excess, uh, you know, parts from a sculptural work or a ceramic work. Even the cake designers also make use of what? The spatula. So, this is the perfect example of the spatula. All right. So, now let's look at the next one, which is the squeegee. The squeegee. Now, what is a squeegee? Now, the squeegee is a rubber with a wooden handle used to spread or force ink through the mesh onto what? A fabric in screen printing. Now, that's what we call screen printing. You know, like beautiful, like you're looking at my clothes. Now, this clothes, but this is not exactly, this is not screen printing. This is a, this is a, a flux. Is flux kind of heat transfer that is done here. But in screen printing, we have what we call the mesh. Now, on this mesh, you we we use the squeegee to spread color on the mesh. You know, by the time you apply the color, let me say if I want to write this, I will spread my cloth, I'll put a paper under the cloth, spread it, and then use the mesh, place it on the cloth, and then now we'll not pour our color. So squeegee is the tool we use as against brush. You know, if it's want to paint, we we'll use brush, but for Screen printing, we use what? Squeegee to drive, to force the color on the mesh. And then by the time you remove it, the design will be transferred on the t-shirt or the fabric that you want to print. So that is exactly what the squeegee does. Let me show you exactly how the squeegee looks. For, for some of you that have not seen the squeegee before, you see how the guy is holding the squeegee. So this is exactly what the squeegee is and that is exactly what it does for the printer or the graphics designer. All right, so now let's look at the next one we look at is the throwing wheel. The throwing wheel, you know, the throwing wheel is a machine that is used to what? You know, to, to make ceramics work. It is mainly used by the ceramics people. So that is exactly what the, 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 the throwing wheel is. I'm going to show you the throwing wheel. How can you take care of the throwing wheel? Wash it because you're working with clay, it will mess it up. So after working, make sure you clean and then keep it clean. Remember that the throwing wheel, we have two types of throwing wheel. We have the manual throwing wheel. And the electric or throwing wheel. These are two different types of what throwing wheel. Now, when the manual throwing wheel, you use your leg to paddle. As you're paddling it, it will be turning, and then you use your hand to control your ceramics wear. Why the electric throwing wheel? You just match. You don't have to paddle. So you just match, and then it spins, and then you use your hands to control the, the, the clay on top of what the throwing wheel. Let me show you a perfect example of what the throwing wheel looks like. Now, this is the electrical or the automatic what throwing wheel. Now, this is the pedal. This is the pedal. This is where you match your leg. And when you match, now there is a pan or a plate inside. This very plate, like this one, it will start spinning. And it will be spinning fast. So now you now use your hand to control the clay on top of what? On top of the throwing wheel. So that's exactly how it works. So remember, we have two types of throwing wheel. We have the manual throwing wheel. And then we have what? The automatic what? throwing wheel. Or the electric what? throwing wheel. All right. So I guess that's the much we can take for this for this um for this topic there are a lot of tools and material we can't exhaust them in this topic so you can just go read the other ones try to familiarize yourself with them there are so many tools and there are so many materials so i just itemized some few you know so that that can help you these are the major ones you actually need as a painter a ceramics or what as an artist your pencil there are tools your biro your brush your eraser to mention but a few all these are what tools and material. So in summary, now we looked at the definition of what art tools and material, which I told you that art tools and material, art materials are those things that you can see on a finished work of art. Why the tools are what is used to manipulate the art materials. We also discussed about the importance of art tools. They cannot be overemphasized. Now, mark that they can't be overemphasized. And we also list and explain some of what the tools in this um, class. So now we also talked about how these other materials and tools can be improvised. We talked how they can be improvised, and then we explained how we can actually maintain 
each and every one of these tools that we talked about today. I want to believe you had fun in this class. If there's any material or any tool that you don't really get, you can ask your teachers in school. I guess they can explain those tools and materials for you, for you to understand them better. Now, having said all this, it's time for us to test ourselves and know how far we've gone or how far, you know, we know based on what I just explained. So I'll ask you some one or two questions. So it's Q and A, question and answering time. All right. So define art tools and art materials. Yes, define the art tools. I just explained that now and then define art material. All right. I want to believe you get that, right? Okay. All right. Now, can you also explain how any two, you know, material, how you can make them, how you can improvise them in the place of their absence and how you can maintain them? So any two art materials, how can you improvise the mallet? I talked about the mallet in this class. How can a mallet be improvised? And then how can you take care of a mallet? All right. I want you to do that. Okay. So now... Let's try our hands on random questions on our exam guide and then let's see by now you should have been familiar with the exam guide. So today we talked about the creative art. So I check it. So we go to a year, let's check 2014 and then let's check topic. We talked about you know, tools and materials of ceramics, painting, sculpture, textile crafts, etc. So you just check them, even graphics. You just check them and then you click on OK and then let's click Let's get started. All right, I want us to look at question number 10. And let me see what we have there in question number 10. Engraving techniques can be applied to which of the following crafts? So there is a tool we use for engraving. So which crafts that we can we apply that techniques on? A, is it on calabash, is it on collage, is it on dyeing, is it on leather, or is it on weaving? The answer is what? Engraving can be done on what calabash, so the answer is A. But that's a very good one for those of you. I don't know how many of you got it. All right, let's see question number 12. Let's just try question number 12. Okay. Uh, let's see question 12, 13. Okay, let's do question number 13. Let's see question 13. Now, paper mash is produced by dash paper. A, fiery. B, glazing. Glazing. C, pounding. D, sticky or stitchy and e waxing so paper mash what material does do you need to make a paper mash what kind of is it firing is it glazing is it pounding is it firing paper is it glazing papers is it pounding paper pounding paper is it stitching paper and is it waxing paper all right we use pounded paper for paper mash thank you for participating in today's class you can practice more questions using the exam guide. Now the app scores and give a detailed explanation of all the questions at the end of your practice test. Now you can learn a particular topic of interest with different modes like study mode, mock mode, and practice mode. It also have other features that make learning fun. Now it is a must have for all serious students. Download the app from www examguide.com if you don't have it yet see you in the next class don't forget to subscribe to our channel hit the notification bell and then share this video to anyone you know that would benefit from it thank you and bye bye